to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel the of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of and Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The word of God says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, Old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17. We welcome you today to our study of the benefits of being in Christ. Today we're going to talk about why does a person want to make sure that he's in Christ and that he's a child of God. And we hope that this encouragement will motivate all of us to make sure we're right in the sight of God. Stay tuned as we think about this wonderful subject together. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, the Bible says that every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ Jesus. What a joy and a privilege it is for the child of God to be in Christ. And today we're going to think about what are the benefits? Why is it such a wonderful thing to make sure that a person is actually in Christ? And what does it mean? to really be in Christ. Let's talk about that as we think about our wonderful subject today. The first benefit of being in Christ is that that's where redemption is found. As we think about the idea of redemption, we're talking about being bought back. The idea of redeemed is to be bought back. And Paul mentions this beautiful idea of redemption in Romans chapter 3. And I want you to listen to verse number 24. The scripture says being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption carries the idea of being bought back. We're bought from sin, bought back to God by the blood of Jesus. And friend, how wonderful it is to be redeemed. Colossians 1 verse 14, in whom we have redemption in His blood, the forgiveness of sins. You know, Christians often sing the song, I'm redeemed. And what a beautiful idea that is. But to do that, we've really got to be in Christ. You see, Jesus gave His life as a ransom to buy us back to God. We're ransomed in Christ. Galatians chapter 1, verse 4 following. Revelation 5, you see that scene where John begins to weep because there's no one there to open the seals, to unleash the wrath of God, to save mankind. And then forward steps that lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. He's able to open the seals. He's able to save man from sin and to give salvation because God wants all to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. The price that was ultimately paid to buy us back to God was with the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to hear the words of Galatians chapter 1 as it relates to this idea as Paul speaks about man being ransomed by the blood of Christ and by the great sacrifice that he made. Galatians chapter 1, notice with me if you would, verse number 4. The scripture records these words of Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. There's that idea of a freely giving to buy us back to God. Titus 2 verse 14, he has purchased for himself his own special people zealous for good works. And so being in Christ means that I'm redeemed. The price has been paid for my sins. By the blood of Jesus, I am now bought back to God, and I am indeed a child of the Almighty. What's another wonderful benefit of being in Christ? Friend, in Christ, there's no condemnation. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says it this way, Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. We talk about condemnation. We're emphasizing, the Bible is emphasizing the idea that when God separates the righteous from the wicked, there will be a pronouncement of condemnation. Jesus will say to some, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. 
I never knew you. We read of that in Matthew chapter 25. And for the unbelieving, there's definitely a condemnation. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. There's the condemnation. Christ is coming in judgment one day to reap that judgment on those who do not obey God and on those who do not obey the gospel of Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. Revelation 21, 8, the liars, the cowards, the ungodly, the immoral be cast in the lake of fire. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so when we think about no condemnation, we have to emphasize as well, there's going to be a day of condemnation. But because of Christ, He's overcome sin and we can overcome through Him. Revelation 3 verse 21 clearly says we can overcome through Christ. And the good news is, if I'm in Christ, I won't have to hear those words, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. This is the promise He's promised those who are in Christ, eternal life. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 5. God who cannot lie promised before time that man would be saved. Titus chapter 1, verse number 2. And so I'm living with that hope in my life every day, and so are you, that on the day of judgment, instead of hearing those words, depart from me, if I'm in Christ, here's the alternative. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of your Lord. Thirdly, if I'm in Christ, I have triumph or victory in Christ. I want you to notice the words of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 14 as it relates to this idea. The Apostle Paul here says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of His knowledge in every place. As Christians, we're led in triumph. Where? In Christ. You see, further to be a victory, there's got to be a battle. Further to be triumph, there has to be something to triumph over. And Christians are indeed in a battle. Since the days of Genesis 3, there's been a battle for man's eternal soul. When that serpent slithered in and tempted Adam and Eve, and he's been aggressively trying to tempt man ever since. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5, that we do not wage a fleshly battle. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds and arguments and casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I'm in a spiritual battle right now. I've got to contend earnestly for the faith, Jude verse 3. And I've got to prepare for that battle. I've been given everything possible to prepare. As Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 17 teaches, we have the whole armor of God. We've got the captain, perfect captain of our salvation. If we follow that plan, Christ will save us. Friend, I've got to follow Christ and be in Him if I'm going to be victorious. Now, do we know that's going to happen? Absolutely, it can happen in my life and yours. And Paul's life illustrates that. Paul said this in 2 Timothy 4, verse 6. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. In the future, henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness for those who love the Lord and look forward to His coming. He said, not only for me only, but for all those who look forward to His appearing. Friend, the good news is if I'm a child of God, if I walk in the light and I am truly in Christ, on that day there will be victory. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58 says it this way. Or verse 57 says, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We can hear our name called. We can know that we're right in the sight of God and we can be on the winning side when the battle does finally come to an end. You see, Hebrews 2.14 teaches us the battle's already been decided. The winner's already been decided. Through God, through Christ, we can be victorious. He, through death, Jesus, through death, overcame Him at the power of death and released those who all their lifetime were subject to bondage. Jesus has already won. I need to make sure I'm in Christ and that I am indeed on the winning side. Now, let's talk about another aspect of being in Christ, and this is the one that we opened with. A wonderful aspect of being in Christ is... I get a second chance. Friend, you ever wish you had a second chance on some things? You ever said or done 
or acted in a certain way and you say to yourself, you know, I'd really like to have that to do over. I need a do over. I'd like to restart, get a second chance. Listen again to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If, here's the condition, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. Where is the joy in being in Christ? I get a do-over. I get a second chance. I get to take the eraser and clean the board and start over. What a wonderful idea that is. You see, before Christ, we were dead in sin. Ephesians 2 verse 5, And you He made alive, who were dead in sins and trespasses. That's talking about all of us. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3 verse 23. Uh, the wages of that sin is death, Romans 6, verse 23. But Paul says, Thanks be to God that though you were the slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Before Christ, we were dead in sin, but as new creatures, we now have a new life and a new focus. Romans 6, verse 4, We've been raised out of the watery grave of baptism to walk in newness of life. I get a second chance to be faithful to God. Be faithful unto death. Revelation 2 verse 10, I'll give you the crown of life. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58 that we're to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor is not in vain. Of All the things in this life, all the mistakes I've made, all the things I've said that are wrong and you've said that are wrong, the things that we've done that have contrary to the will of God, where's the beauty of being in Christ? Every one of those, Paul said it this way, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, If anyone's in Christ, old things have passed away. All that's been put behind us. Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind, pressing forward to those things which are ahead. Philippians 3 verses 10 through 12, God said, I'll be merciful their sins, their lawless deeds. I'll remember no more. Hebrews chapter 8 verse number 12. But you know, there's another idea that's so wonderful about the benefits of being in Christ and it's this. The Bible says every spiritual blessing is in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse number 3. And we could enumerate a host of those. For example, we have the privilege now of being God's children. 1 John 3 verse 1, the Bible says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we can be called children of God. I have the privilege of doing just like Jesus said. I can look up into heaven and say, Our Father who art in heaven, Matthew 6, verse 9. I can know that God, as a loving Father, cares deeply for me. Cast all your cares upon Him. He cares for you, 1 Peter 5, verse 7. Part of that spiritual blessing not only means I have the privilege of being a child of God, but I have part of that inheritance of God, that heavenly inheritance can be mine. How did Paul look at his true citizenship? In Philippians 3 verse 21, the Apostle Paul said, Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus, who will transform our lowly body into His glorious body. One day I can hear the words, Well done, good and faithful servant, and I can enter in to that glorious home in heaven. What a great spiritual blessing that indeed is. Now, friend, let me offer such an encouraging one to us today. As it relates to being in Christ, here's a very encouraging one. Every child of God who has died faithfully in the Lord will rise and meet the Lord in the air. The dead in Christ will be with the Lord and we can be reunited with them. Listen to Revelation 14, verse 13. The Bible says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. That's the idea of being in Christ. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16 says that we will not precede them. Rather, if we're alive and remain, we'll be caught up together with them in the air to meet the Lord in the clouds, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. They're going to be with the Lord. We're going to be with the Lord. The dead in Christ will rise first, and what a joy that will be. My loved ones and your loved ones who've passed on, God's going to take care of them. We can be reunited. They have that joy and hope of being with the Lord in heaven forever. And so as we think about 
the idea of putting God first and making sure that we're right, friend, what a joy that is for every child of God. But you know, there's another idea that is so important as it relates to being in Christ, and it's this. One of the great principles of the Bible that we find is that grace is found in Christ. I want you to notice with me, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. We talk about the grace of God that saves, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, and how true that is. But where is grace found at? Listen to Titus chapter 2, verse number 11. The Bible teaches, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all man. Grace has appeared. It's here. Well, where is it at? John 1 verse 17. The law came through Moses. Listen to this now. But grace and truth are in Christ. Where's grace? In Christ. 2 Timothy 2 verse 10 says salvation is also in Christ. That grace that saves. That grace that brings God's favor toward us is only found in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, as we think today about every spiritual blessing being in Christ, friend, we also have to think about and ask the question to ourselves, am I in Christ? Well, friend, let's think about what the Bible says one's got to do to be in Christ. Here's what the Bible does not say. The Bible does not say that you believe only and you're in Christ. The Bible does not say that you say the sinner's prayer and you get in Christ. The Bible doesn't say lay your hand on the TV and you'll get it. No, that's not what it says. How does the Bible say one gets in Christ? Now remember again why this is important. Every spiritual blessing is in Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 3. Salvation is in Christ. 2 Timothy 2 verse 10. How does man who is lost in sin get in Christ? Well, let's open our Bible and let's see for ourselves how the Bible says we get in Christ. Would you turn in your Bible with me to Galatians chapter 3 and I want you to look in verse number 27. The Bible makes it abundantly clear that we get into Christ by being baptized into Christ. It's, it's God that saves. It's Christ that saves. It's God's grace that saves. But what requirement does God give to get into Christ? Notice for yourself. Galatians 3 verse 27, Paul says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Question, how does the Bible say, according to Galatians 3 27, how does the Bible say a person gets into Christ? As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13, by one spirit we're baptized into the one body. We get into Christ by being baptized into His body, baptized into His death and His sacrifice. Now friend, I understand that there's a lot of confusion, that there's a whole lot of people who teach a whole lot of various ideas about salvation and how to be saved and how to get into Christ. Here's what we want to ask you to think about. As we think about the benefits of being in Christ and how important that is, let's just think, what does the Bible say? What does God's Word actually say a person has to do to be saved and to get into Christ? Not what's popular, not what are men teaching. What does God say? Well, the Bible says, first of all, you've got to hear the Word of God. Romans 10 verse 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now, why is hearing the Word of God so important? It's the only way you get faith, right? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. If it's impossible to please God without faith, whatever way I get faith is essential, right? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I've got to hear the message of salvation today. If you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts, the psalmist said in Psalm 95, verse 7. He who has ears to hear, Jesus said, let him hear. Revelation 2 and 3. And so, are we willing to listen to the message of salvation, to study our Bible and see if what we're being told is true? Once I've heard the Word of God, the Bible then teaches that I must believe Jesus is the Son of God. I want you to think about the example of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. 
Here, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch are traveling down the road. He's in the chariot teaching him the gospel. Uh, he's been talking to him about Christ, telling him about the scriptures, about the Messiah. In the distance, this Ethiopian eunuch sees water. And here's what he says. See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Do you remember the hindrance? If you believe with all your heart, you may. Acts chapter 8, verses 35 through 38. And so, to be saved, a person must believe Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Savior of the world. Uh, you shall call His name Jesus. He'll save His people from their sins. And that without Him, there's no hope. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. There's no other name you can be saved by. Acts 4, verse 12, Nor is there salvation any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so, once I hear the word, I must believe in Jesus as the Son of God. Then, I must be willing to repent of sin in my life. The great day of Pentecost, when they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The answer was, Repent and be baptized. Acts 2 verse 38. Jesus taught the essentiality of it when He said, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Luke chapter 13 verse 3. But what is repentance? It's a turning. A turning from sin and turning to God. It's a changed way of thinking that leads to a changed way of acting. Acts 3 verse 19, Peter preached, Repent and turn, that your sins may be blotted out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. God has a commanded that all men everywhere must repent. Acts chapter 17 verse 30 and 31. But once I've heard the message, I have believed Jesus is the Son of God. I am willing to repent and turn to God I also must confess Christ as Lord and Savior. Here's what Jesus said. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33, Jesus said this, If you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. But if you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before my Father who is in heaven. We need to do just like the Ethiopian eunuch was told. If you believe with all your heart, you may. He said, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Romans 10 verse 10, With the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then, friend, the Bible teaches that for a person to get into Christ, for a person to be saved, the Bible says he must be baptized. I know there's a lot of folks who say baptism's not essential. And friend, don't misunderstand me. It's God who saves. It's the blood of Jesus that saves. It's the sacrifice of Christ, no doubt, that saves. But does the Bible say one must be baptized to access the death of Christ? Romans 6 verses 3 and 4 says, As many of you as were baptized into Christ, there's that word again, as many of you as were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ or baptized into His death. We're baptized into the death, the sacrifice, and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is why Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Friend, did Jesus say in your Bible and mine, did Jesus say baptism is essential to salvation? John 3 verse 5, He absolutely did. Jesus said, Unless a man is born of water, and the Spirit, He cannot enter the kingdom of God. Well, what were people told to do in the New Testament when they asked what they had to do to be saved? Acts chapter 2 was that exact question. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts chapter 2 verse 37. They were cut to the heart and they asked that question. Peter said, you need to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Baptism is for the remission of sins. Think about the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 9, he is told by the Lord, you go into the city, it'll be told you what you must do. Must do to what? Be saved. He goes into the city. Ananias comes to him. Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling 
on the name of the Lord. Acts 22, verse 16. And friend, I want you to listen carefully to this one. God could not make it any clearer if He wanted to. Sometimes people say to me, well, the Bible never says you've got to be baptized to be saved. Friend, it explicitly does. 1 Peter 3, verse 21, listen to these words. Baptism does now also save us. If God's Word says baptism saves, then friend, that's essential. And man cannot be saved until he obeys what God says. And so we hope today, we're begging, we're pleading with you today to become a Christian. We hope you'll be encouraged by the benefits we have of being in Christ. And we hope that every one of us will strive to live in such a way that our life brings honor and glory to the ultimate King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.